Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, let me ask you, how many of us have used Django or use Django in daily, daily work? Great, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> okay, I'll first quickly introduce myself before we start. Uh, my name is Ivaio Donchev. Uh, I'm from Bulgaria. I'm a technical team lead in uh, Hacksoft, in a software company in Bulgaria. Uh, we're basically using Django a lot, I mean, a lot. And yeah, we aim to be up to date with the latest Django trading, and that's why the topic of facing Django came. It's not something new. We know it like three years ago with Django 3.1, but it's something that's still growing. It's not, it's not yet, it's not yet established as a standard. So, when we had the async Django, if you open the documentation, you'll see that. And then, when I opened it, my first thought was, okay, it seems like I need to just put an async keyword uh, before my def definition of the view, and that's all. And it works, it really works. But then, I said to myself, okay, I'm going to, to execute an ORM query. And I got that. And I was like, okay, I put the, this magic async word, whatever it means, before my view. Isn't it already at async? I mean, yeah, I, I knew nothing at that point. <laughs> so let's first go through the terms. What's the difference between sync and async? Well, the standard Python code that we use in Django is synchronous. It means that we define a sequence of actions that will be executed once at a time. The asynchronous code is another pattern. You basically define a set of actions that needs to be executed, not necessarily in the same order. And they, they need to be executed concurrently and potentially in parallel. So what's the difference? You can, if two things are going parallel, it means they are making, they're actually making progress at the same point. So we'll see that in the examples after that. So another question, how many of you have used async Python? Okay, great. I'm gonna quickly go through this. Then. So we basically have three main tools uh, for async Python. We have other, but this is the three that we are going to focus on. We have process, we have threads, and we have coroutines. So multiprocessing, what that means? It's basically a Python way to start a physically start a new process in the operating system that potentially could be handled by another CPU. So that, that basically the, the way to scale and use your CPUs from your, or your Python program. And it's really powerful for, for heavy calculations. Trading. Okay, so trading in Python are not like trading in some other languages like Java, for example. Normally, you, you, you'd use thread in Java to use another CPU and basically gain more CPU power. In Python, because of the global interpreter work, you cannot do that because C Python is not thread safe. It, the decision had been made to introduce this global interpreter walk on top of CPython that we basically prevents a single CPU to, or a single process, to handle more than one thread. So it basically cannot scale, and scale in CPUs, but you can unblock your I.O. operations. I see that. Uh, so yeah, there is a really good talk of David Beasley that he said the threats, it binds you the ability to stop and block, basically. So yeah, let, let's see an example. We have a simple function that only sleeps for two seconds. We use time sleep a lot in this presentation. It, you can think of it as a equivalent, equivalent to an ORM query or, or calling a third party. They're all IO operations. So if I want to execute 
this code five times this function, normally I'll make for loop and just run it five times. If I want to make it concurrently and in parallel, I'll then import this threading module, pass the function, then start all the threads, which will basically tell the operating system that it should make start making progress on them, and then wait for them to finish. And we can see in the example that they're actually sleeping at the same time without each one blocking the others. So yeah, we have processes and threads. But since Python 3, we have a really good interface to another pattern of facing programming. And this is the async IO module. And basically the async await keyword that came with Python 3. The key thing here is that you're getting exactly the same benefits that you would get with threads, but coroutines are faster than threads because of the implementation of the, uh, of the coroutines. And they run inside a thread, and if you, if you run a coroutines in a thread, you, we call that async thread. And the other key thing is threads are cooperative. We'll see that in the next example why. So how do you use that? First, you need to start your main function in async IO loop. Then each function, each coroutine, is a standard Python function, but it needs to be defined with the, this async word before that. And basically, if you want to call an async function, you need to await it. So yeah, here's a more complex example. Uh, you have the main function that's uh, awaiting a coroutine function twice, which is calling a synchronous function, which is, we don't have problem of that. You can actually call synchronous code in asynchronous context. But this is, this is actually really dangerous. In, I told you that uh, the coroutines are cooperative. And we see that in this example. We have two coroutines, good coroutine, which uses the async IO sleep. That's the time sleep equivalent uh, in async context that doesn't actually block the entire thread. And we have a bad coroutine that uses standard time sleep that actually blocks the thread. And then we see, we call the async IO gather, which is the Python way to say, I wait for all this coroutine concurrently. So what happens is that both functions sleep for five seconds. We have a thousand coroutines starting, then they, they wait for the one coroutine that blocks the thread to finish and then continue. It basically mean if you have one bad coroutine, it could ruin the day for everyone, basically. So yeah, that's, that's really dangerous. And the rule number one is don't block the main thread. That's the, the most important thing. And then we have the futures library. Futures library is the high level interface that, uh, com that uses both processes, threads, and coroutines. So if, you have, if we have these three toolings, let's say, what, what if we can actually call can actually make the async Python and the synchronous Python to talk each other and make a blocking operation from the synchronous Python, for example, from some legacy code that doesn't actually block the main thread. And we can do that. Let's say we, we want to interface that just a decorator, some magic decorator that puts this into event loop and doesn't block the thread. Let's say that decorator looks like this. It's a pretty complex, but what it does is basically runs the thread pool executor, which is a class instantiated from the futures and starts a new thread, throws the function there, make an 
so-called future or awaitable objects that behaves like a coroutine, then you can actually use it as a coroutine. But it's actually you're, you're moving your code to another thread and waiting to finish the main thread. So yeah, just have in mind this example. We'll get back to it later. Oh, async Django. Uh, we're going to see this picture a lot. I think it's really, really nice. This it just shows on a high level what's happening into the request response cycle in Django. Uh, that's how it normally looks like. We have an nginx that usually behaves like a load balancer. Then the request goes to the withgi. Then it moves through the, a chain of middlewares, hits our view with the business logic and meanwhile communicates with the ORM. So the first bottleneck of introducing asynchronous uh, behavior in, in Django is the views. And that's the tools that we have, processes, threads, and coroutines. Well, we don't really talk much about the processes because the websites and web apps are by definition more IO heavily, not more CPU heavily. Normally, when you make an HTTP request, your website communicates with a database or calling a third party rather than making some calculations. So yeah, let, let's see what if we use threads in our, our views. This example, it, it looks strange, it, it actually works. <laughs> you can actually start new threads and uh, make an ORM query or send an email, then start for them to finish and then uh, uh, start them, then wait for them to finish. But that, that's first hard to manage. Then how do you handle exceptions? I mean, that's an entirely new thread. What happens with the transaction atomic? By the way, transaction atomic, uh, the, key, the key point here is that the database connection in Django is thread bound. So if you start a new thread, you forget about the transaction atomic in the same context. And that's not good for data fetching, obviously. So it's clear that Django uh, went f with async IO for this behavior. Uh, we have this small example with uh, this view. And that, that would work, but we don't have the event loop running. That was the first problem with, when introducing these views. And that leads us to the second bottleneck, the WSGI. So what is WSGI? WSGI is Maybe one of the best things that happens to Python is the, actually the standard that make Python suitable for web programming. It's used uh, for, for, uh, from Django, from Fast API, Flask, any web framework, basically. It defines a single interface for that. But it's never made to be async. That's not, that was not the idea of it. So we need a new, new, new standard. We need the ASGI, Asynchronous Server Gateway Interface. And this is a quote from the documentation, Agi, the spiritual successor to Wilgi. <laughs> it basically adding an event loop uh, implementation and provide an interface for core teams. So we saw that. We have an interface for core teams uh, in the gateway interface. And on the other side, we have uh, a way to define asynchronous view. But we have middlewares between them. How do we handle them? Well, here's how a standard middleware looks like. It's a basically a higher order function that accepts a, a get response function that will handle the, the business logic. And the new thing here is that this function could be a standard Python function or could be a coroutine. So we basically need an if else statement that checks if this is a coroutine. But the next problem is how does the ASGI knows if your middleware is already handling both coroutines and uh, standard functions? Because it would, it would be good if you have some not suitable middleware to get a warning about that. Well, we have decorators that comes out of the box from Django. 
and what they do is just attaching two new properties uh, to your middleware. So if you imagine the Algi server like a for loop handling request, it checks the, the view, check the middleware if they are async capable, and then pass the request. And that's that's actually the official example from the Django documentation. That's how it looks like to write an async middleware. But this decorator is more or less uh, depending on the goodwill of, of the developers. So let's say you're installing a third party, which is making a blocking operation inside the middleware, like ORM query, and they didn't put the decorator. So what happens then, uh, I'm telling you from my experience, a few hours of debugging, uh, it's you're sending a request, you're sending a bunch of requests, and you know that you have async APIs, but they all behave as synchronous APIs, because, because the middleware is like, if, you know, it blocks the main thread, it doesn't allow the junk to be async. So yeah, just, just to have in mind, some bad experience. And yeah, this is my favorite part, the ORM. So imagine that you're a Django core developer and you have a project that's uh, like 15 years old. And the most complex module inside is never made to be async. Where, where do you start from? You cannot start from scratch, obviously. Uh, so we we can we don't have an easy way to do that because the database first of all database adapter is synchronous <coughs> so we need to prevent that we need to this this error is basically saying to you i don't know what you're doing but please stop that that's wrong i mean you're blocking the thread and they do that yeah for rule number 1 don't block the main thread and they do that this is uh uh, code block from the Postgres uh, database backend. It, it applies to the MySQL and the other, but uh, they have this AC unsafe decorator. It's basically telling you if you're trying at this key point where the SQL query is triggered, if you're trying to do that and you're into an event loop, just raise an error. And that's the example that we saw before starting with the Django. So we actually had a, have a way to make a blocking operation uh, that is blocking operation inside an event loop we have a, as a core team that doesn't actually block the main thread. And that's what they did, but they call it sync to async and async to sync. That's basically the the core implementation. I mean, these guys that released the algorithm that part from the Django, uh, it's an our package, but part of the Django uh, organization. Uh, these guys are damn smart. There's uh, tons of checks, tons of validation inside. But the core logic says, if you want to use the ORM, put it into a thread, wait for it, and yeah. And yeah, async to think is basically doing the, the just the opposite thing with similar implementation. So this is a more complex example of how it works. You can basically put this decorator to sync to async to a normal Python function, and you can await it. You can call a coroutine from it. You can decorate the coroutine like async to async, async to sync which will make it a normal standard, sorry, standard uh, Python function. And that worked fine. So what happens with the transaction atomic? We said that the database connection is thread bound, but you, if you, if every time that, that you make some ORM query, you go to another thread, you, you still lose the ability to make atomic transactions. Well, the truth is that you can make them, but you must encapsulate the codes that make sense to be transaction atomic into a synchronous box and then call them 
uh, with uh, sync to async. You cannot depend on the standard way of making uh, atomic uh, atomic requests to an entire HTTP request. You you just have to to pay more attention which blocks actually make sense to be uh, put into a transaction. So yeah, it increases the complexity a little bit. And you can use this utility functions, sync to async, to basically all the ORM methods. But but you need to put it into the method that actually triggers the query. So if you see the last example with the user.objects.all, because the user.objects.all doesn't make a query, it makes a query when you start actually iterating over it, uh, you need to, tr to apply the function to the thing that actually triggers the iterator inside it. And what's new, that, that's actually, uh, there was a pull request that, were, that was open in the Django repository for like a few months or something. And it was March two or three weeks ago. It's completely new. It will be released in Django 4.1, uh, which puts an asynchronous version of almost each of the methods of the query set. And they add this A before the method. So we can await them. With the f functions that, that are iterators, you don't need that because you can define them both as standard iterators and asynchronous it uh, generated back, uh, basically. So yeah, this is really nice. Uh, if you wonder how it works under the hood, they wrap the functions that trigger the query with sync to async. It's the same thing, but the good thing is that if they change the implementation, you're using the Django a official Django API of the ORM, so they, they are free to change the internal implementation now. And you don't have to use this utility function. So yeah, what what did we achieve with all of this? If we if we did our, our task to not block the main thread, let, let, let's say this this simple view. This is uh, just sleeping for no point one seconds. It's not not doing something uh, chaos. So what I did is sent a hundred requests simultaneously to the API and see how it behaves. And this is this is uh, the performance when you deploy your code with WSGI. So it, what basically done is if you have a, if you send a hundred request, it uh, handle the first, handle the second, the third, fourth. So yeah, you wait around for ten seconds. If you use SGI, what happens is if you if you send a hundred requests, it's actually slower for everyone. It's actually slower because you block the thread. Each of them blocks the thread, and all of them wait, because Adgi, by by definition, is handling. Uh, that's what what I say in the documentation. It's async outside, but it's synchronous inside. So they handle all the requests, and then depends on the fact you 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 are not blocking the thread. Uh, so let's say we we move our we uh, we rework our view as an async API. What happens is it, it's like 10 times faster or something. All of the, the only limitation is the threads that you could spawn to handle the request, to handle the, uh, if you use the, the standard time sleep. For example, if you replace that with an ORM query. And yeah, having that in mind, you you, you can also, but this is, this is uh, on our topic, you have a way to fine tune how many threads you could spawn from the very beginning in the Django that can handle the uh, that can handle the ORM interactions, and basically have a way to potentially concurrently make multiple transaction atomic blocks. So, what we had, we have four phases to make our Django framework async. The first one, the or was with the ASGI support, which makes it possible to have a core team interface of the chain. Then we have the middleware, and this is this is uh, maybe the slowest part because 
we depend on the ecosystem around Django, all the third parties, to migrate and make sure they, they're suitable for racing, which many of them already did. Then we have the views that just need to be uh, coroutines. And we have the ORM that the current state is you can make it asynchronous from the, from the perspective of the main thread, but you cannot simultaneously send a hundred of queries. And yeah, the point of uh, these talks, and I, I hope I made it uh, clear, it was that we have we have a really good and stable framework. We knew that the future is async, and we, we need to get at that point. Uh, we need to get there at some point. We knew that back three years ago when Django 3.1 uh, came, and we have a plan to do that. We just need time to to get there. Here's a list of useful uh, links that explains the, we're going, by the way, we're going to share the presentation in LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. So if you're, uh, if it's interesting to you, you can check it later. Uh, and yeah, I'll be happy if you have some questions and thank you very much for the attention. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question for ORM. Do we have some limitation for database in giants? Like, will it work for MySQL, Postgres, for all of them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, you mean, you, if you have some limitations uh, in the simultaneous connections? Or? Yes, yes. Well, there is, every database has a limitation of how many connections uh, could, be, uh, could be made to it. Uh, you have a f way to fine tune that from the Django. It's, it's the so called adgi underscore threads uh, uh, setting, environment setting. So that basically tells the sync to async uh, class to how many threads it should execute it executed when you start the Django, how many threads it will be executed from the very beginning, mm -hmm. and wait for them to handle. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you know, uh, like in terms of the solution that was designed uh, to, to have a sync ORM, how does this compare to like uh, SQL Alchemy that has also an async uh, like backend now, currently? I'm not sure how it handles it. I've used uh, SQL Alchemy like a few years ago. Not sure what's the state there. Okay, there thank you. Uh, hello, um, hey. about the middlewares and their compatibility with async. Uh, there is fun fact that the middleware mixing that was uh, supposed to bring very old middlewares into Django 2.0, I think, also adds the uh, async function just by wrapping the, it in async to sync. So you can yeah. apply it to newer middlewares to make them async uh, aware. Yeah, That's yeah. not really a question, just a yeah, hint. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't tried that, but yeah, sounds like a good idea. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, as a developer that has a non-async Django application and wants to move to an async one, do I have to go to every step of the way? Like, um, I assume ORMs and views, mm -hmm. yes, and, the, and switch from the WSG to the A. Yeah. Like, how does the middleware, like, how does migration look like? Well, it depends on, yeah, basically the state of the project. If you can move to, first step is obviously moving from WSG to ADGI. Uh, then you may you need to make sure that uh, your first up to date Django, so your mid internal middlewares are handling coroutines. Uh, then, if you use some third party middlewares, that they are actually doing that. Uh, and the next step is basically defining. Uh, I don't know if there's an easy way for your existing views APIs. Probably better way will be to introduce a new one, uh, new ones that could reuse the same logic from, from the uh, legacy code by wrapping them with sync to async.
Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, are there some benchmarks available comparing Django run the traditional old way and the async way? Uh, no, what I used for the example was uh, a CLI to call hey, uh, that you can tell how many requests you send simultaneously and, and what portions. And uh, what I did is just send a single portion of uh, 100 requests to the view. Thank you all for coming. Okay.